some data about just how dynamic uh, behavior is. This relates to the financial industry and the airlines industry, and it is something that we really have to think about. If you have a look at, you start in year one, and you then look at year two, and you see where did value come from? Where did I grow the business? Where did the business decline? And what was responsible for the changes that I see in the business? Defection has very little to do with business losses. In this particular, um, in this particular survey, the decrease uh, in, in value to the financial services industry to the typical bank was 3% and to the typical airline was 3% due to defection. Most of the business losses come from people who start using competitors more. They're still in our customer base, but they use competitors more, 24%. Now, fortunately for us, all of us are in business, there are lots of people who are in our customer base who start using us more, sorry, less and more. Uh, another 25%, so everything looks flat on the surface, but it's phenomenally dynamic underneath. And most of our measurement systems tend to be static. And if you have a look at the numbers who are moving inside customer bases, 70% of people in these what we typically think of as fairly static industries had changed the, the share of wallet that they were, that they were allocating and had started to allocate money away to, uh, towards competitors or otherwise allocate money towards competitors. And of course, in packaged goods, it is far, far worse. One of the first things I did also when I got back was have a look at just how dynamic behavior is in packaged goods, and it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal how few people survive as loyal customers from one year to another. So we have to start improving our metrics and design systems that understand these underlying dynamics a lot better. The best place to start, I think, is with the TNS growth map. It has two dimensions on it. The one dimension is the classical defection acquisition dimension, but the other dimension is the management of share of wallet and the way in which people allocate their spending in a category. Um, and then to suggest that there are two things we have to get right if we want to understand how an individual person makes choices when they have a choice. And the first thing we need to get right is commitment. And by commitment, I mean the kind of fundamental bond that if we get it right, develops between a person and the choices that they've made. But the second thing we have to get right is we have to understand the factors that are beyond your customer's control, the things that influence their behavior that, that, that they can't, the, the extent to which they just don't have choices. And so what I've spent quite a lot of time since, and still called the conversion model since coming back, is rebuilding what we were doing around these two things. When I came into the industry, there was a basic notion that if you increase customer satisfaction, you get loyalty. Um, but by the mid-1990s, that was in serious trouble because at the individual level, we found satisfied people stay and dissatisfied people go and so on. And so we got the evolution of what I think is one of the most dangerous marketing doctrines in the world. And what I want to talk about here is the importance of brand and the importance of going a little bit further uh, than we've tended to go before. Uh, and so out of uh, the United States comes a Harvard Business Review article that says the problem is you've got to delight people. It's only when you delight them that you get real commitment. And from that evolved the whole customer experience thing. Manage customer experiences, drive it up, and all the rest of it. Um, why do I say that's one of the most dangerous doctrines in the world? What's the problem? Um, this is the problem. Nothing has the power to delight a human being forever. Nothing. Nothing. I'll say it again in case you didn't hear nothing. I've been, I need to see your body language here. I've been, I've, I've, I met somebody when she was 14 and I was 15. And we've been together ever since. It's an absolute bloody miracle. And, you know, I wake up in the morning, I turn over, there she is, unbelievable. <laughs> and, and I have to, as I stand here, I have to confess that I haven't delighted her all the time. I haven't been a source of wonderful customer experiences. 
And there she is. And you know what? It wasn't just for the children, because the children have all left home and she's still there. It's incredible. <laughs> the problem with human beings is habituation. We get used to what you do. And then we say to you, what are you going to do next? How are you going to surprise me next? How are you going to make the experience even better next time? And we've known this for a very long time. In fact, the first time we find it in human culture is Buddha. When Buddha discovered that nothing had the power to delight him all the time, he got so depressed he went and sat under a tree for a very long time and then tried to save the rest of us. But what it does, if that's what, is, if that's what you believe you have to do, what it does is create a spending black hole because you do something and people are delighted and then they get used to it and they say, what are you going to do next? And you've created a source of spending for yourself. Uh, and it doesn't work anymore. Fortunately, fortunately, fortunately for me, because she's still there, my breeding partner and co-director, fortunately, brings me to the first universal truth of commitment. She stays committed even when she's dissatisfied. I don't have to delight her because it is a characteristic of human nature that we can form these really deep attachments and that's why I use the word commitment. And this is where commitment comes in and what we need to talk about or understand is how brands do this. How do they do it? Because the state of mind that she and I happen to be in, it appears, is a state of mind like that. Commitment stays high irrespective of the day-to-day -day fluctuations. What causes that is the importance of the relationship. It is not just about satisfaction and so forth. It's because this is really important to me. And until we find ways to make brands important to people, and this is about branding, it's why I love branding so much, we don't create those states of mind. So um, here's a brand that takes this seriously. This is fizzy water. With, with, uh, it's carbonated water with, uh, with, um, with burnt sugar and some caffeine. And the first ever view that we had of the brand in a person's brain was this landmark study that was done in the United States in 2004. And there it is, in case you're wondering. That is Coca-Cola in the brain of an ordinary person. What's important about that is we discover what's needed to create commitment. And there are two pieces. I'm now going to sound like I know what I'm talking about. I haven't got a clue. But there are two pieces. The hippocampus, which is where emotional memories are stored. It's where you remember the feelings that you have when you use something. And secondly, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I can actually say this without looking at my slides which is another piece of the brain that, that makes decisions on the basis of how you feel about things. You lean towards some things and away from others. But there's another really important piece of research. Frank Sarazit from the United States sent this to me a few weeks ago, just recently. We've got the first piece of brain research where the brain scanner did better than a survey. The way people responded to the ad under the, under the brain, the brain scanner revealed better which ad was going to work than a survey. And there's the piece of the brain that had to light up. And, and why I like this so much, the beauty of it is that that part of the brain, the frontopolar prefrontal cortex, it's incredible how knowledgeable you can sound, is the piece that takes all the rest of it and then decides what you're really going to do. That's where commitment happens. Which takes me to the second universal truth of commitment, which is that if you don't do this, you don't get commitment the relationship stays shallow. And it's one of the reasons why behavior is so dynamic. Now, we could leave it there if it weren't for a very awkward question. Is it possible to be in love with more than one? At this point, I have to put my glasses on again. <laughs> um, Sheila and I, the, this young woman who, whatever, we got over-enthusiastic and had four kids. And anybody who knows has had more than one child will know that the answer is obviously yes. Human beings are capable of multiple enthusiasm. In fact, it's a normal state. 
of human nature. Of course, when it comes to the person you have children with, you should only have one. The unfortunate reality is that it's hard to only have one. And so why should you expect a committed person to give you all your money? Why shouldn't it be possible for them to be just as committed to somebody else? I'm committed to the Western. I think it's a great hotel. When you survey me, I would say to you, I recommend it. I'm going to stay there again, and I'm always happy when I leave. But if you'd bothered to ask me about the Intercontinental, I would have given the same answers. I would have said that I would recommend it too. I would have said that I'm very happy, and I would have said that I will definitely be staying there again. The way we model all of this is something called the butterfly catastrophe. It's been around a long time. Um, and it involves uh, the following very simple um, implementation set. So what we're saying here is that if we understand brands and branding and the work that branding can do, we can understand how people get into a different state of mind and drive the share of business that we get higher. And it doesn't matter what product category, it's a universal mechanism. And it's the mechanism I discovered when I was working in religion and trying to understand uh, religious conversion. How do we do this? We must identify what's relevant to the person. I will only understand your behavior if I understand the things you could change to. We need two questions. We must have a performance question. It's not good for me. So I mean, this, um, my co-director who spent so many years with me, she would probably say, well, look, you didn't delight me all the time, but it wasn't so bad. It'd not be good if I kept her in a state of disappointment for the 40 years or whatever it is that we've been together. But I must also measure whether those deeper connections are taking place between the offer, the offer that I make as a product or a service, and the things that are important to my customer, whether I connect to the things that are important to them. It needn't take long, it's only 46 seconds, but we improve the, we close the gap. We close the gap between the measures that we make in the survey and real behavior. Now I'm watching the clock ticking here. Um, there's the equation, it's not a black box anymore, it's in the public domain. It, is, it looks like Greek, it is Greek, um, but there is an English version of it too. Uh, I put that up there just so that you see that it's there, you can look at it later. So I'm suggesting more questions, because I'm suggesting the brand is important. It doesn't matter what, you, what domain you're in, whether you're in a loyalty domain, a customer experience domain, a brand domain, it doesn't matter, brand is important. Because that's how these things get into those other parts of the brain that need to light, light up. And so your, your worry is, oh shit, more questions. So I want to spend the next little bit of time talking about how we can cut the questions that we ask.